But today, the general plan is really to just uh, watch the recording of um, our Australian counterparts presentation. So they had um, a presenter from Israel give a talk about expansion on whole tissue imaging. And yeah, so we'll be recording that. It's about 40 minutes long. It's also uploaded on uh, the YouTube channel. So if anyone wants to go back and watch that, or you know, if you have to leave early today, no worries. You can always uh, watch the recording. Um, we'll have a short discussion afterwards. So just a reminder, today's meeting will end at 10 a.m. Um, EST, or I guess, let's see if I can. But yeah, it'll be one hour long, essentially. Natalie, do you want to drop the link to the recording into the notes document? Then that way, if anybody does come to the notes document after the event, they'll be able to find it in there too. Sure, of course. Let me open this link. There you go. Um, please let me know if that works. Um, Okay, so um, while everyone's adding the names on the attendance sheets, um, I do have one other news. So I, um, before the holidays, I reached out to Dr. Ed Boyden and he was really responsive. Um, I told him about our group, our initiative, and just kind of what we did in our last meeting where we had the journal club and talked about his new, uh, the new paper from his lab. And he was very excited to know that um, you know, our group exists and we're so passionate about this technique. So he has offered to potentially in the new or in our next few meetings, um, come to one of them and give us a seminar and have like a big Q&A session. So there isn't a time and date set yet. So it'll likely be our April meeting. Um, so yeah, just keep an eye out for that and make sure if you're really interested in asking him any questions specifically to come join us for that meeting. Um, so yes, if you're just joining us, if you haven't had a chance to put your name in the attendance list in this document that I'm just about to drop in the chat, please go ahead and do that. That will help, help us keep track of who all is here. Uh, and that document is also where you'll find all the notes from all of the activities and there's also the link to the recording that we're going to watch. Um, Natalie, are you going to share your screen and share the recording that way? Great. Yep. Exactly. When's time? Great. We'll give a few more opportunity for a few more to come in. I see the numbers are increasing a little bit. Yeah. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen first. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to hit play and let me know if um, the audio is working. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Alina, I'm uh, from the Weizmann Institute of Israel, and uh, at uh, our last... Okay, so I'm just going to give an intro to her first um, before I keep playing that video. So this is Alina Kulp Kulpakov from the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and um, this is her presentation where she just talks about an overview on a whole tissue imaging using multiple expansion microscopy techniques. And she's specifically visualizing spermatogenesis in Drosophila. So I'm personally not um, a Drosophila person. I don't know much about it. So if we have anyone in the audience or any group of people in the audience who um, are very well-versed in Drosophila, it would be great if you could provide your input to us during our discussion at the end. 
but um, yeah, just a fair warning here. Um, so without further ado, I'll start the meeting or I'll start the video. The meeting that was held a couple of months ago, um, I uh, was, I guess I was the only one who had much experience in the expansion, so I wanted to share it with you and uh, just to show you some techniques that I've been using. Uh, so this lecture will be a bit technical, so just with some uh, tips, what do you uh, can do to improve you, this technique or to use it to apply to your samples. So it will be like a quick overview of, the, of several techniques and uh, free, feel free to contact me or ask questions during the presentation or by the end. So I'll just share my presentation. Sorry, oh, I just didn't start from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, I work uh, on the Drosophila testes, and in this image, you can see one of the expanded uh, samples. You can see dividing uh, cells. So, the blue is the nucleus, and the purple one, like the pinkish one, is the mitochondria. Um, and uh, I want to. Sorry. I don't sorry. see your screen. Up. You don't see my screen. Oh, sorry. We were seeing it before. Oh, uh, this one. Okay. Now you see it. Do you see it now? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, maybe it's just me. <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, I'll can see the try again. Are you people there saying they can see it? So maybe I just did something wrong. Gabriela, do you see it now? Yeah, I think that's better, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so as I was uh, saying, here you can see two dividing cells. Uh, the blue is the nucleus. It's the, like, just a 3D reconstruction done by Marek's uh, software. So it's, uh, the, the blue is the nucleus and the, the pink one is uh, mitochondria. Uh, so, I would like first to introduce my system. I work on uh, Drosophila testes. This is the schematic representation of Drosophila testes. So, this system is really nice because uh, the differentiation of the sperm occurs as uh, it progresses along the testes. So, the, uh, here's the niche of the stem cells. Uh, each unit of the stems of the germ cells is surrounded by cyst cells, somatic cyst cells. They divide uh, synchronously uh, for mitotic divisions. Uh, here you can see that uh, the early stages of the spermatogenesis. So they start as a primary spermat uh, spermatogonium. They start to divide uh, for the uh, meiotic divisions, uh, finishing by uh, these uh, uh, eight interconnected uh, large cells called spermatocytes. In this uh, stage, the cells aggregate, uh, sorry, the cells uh, accumulate uh, a lot of uh, material and they uh, grow in size and then their meiosis. So they go through two meiotic divisions. And uh, after that, uh, we end up with uh, 16, uh, sorry, 64, after two meiotic divisions, we end up with uh, 64 interconnected round spermatids. And uh, in this stage, something really unique happens. All the mitochondria aggregate next to the nucleus and they start to fuse forming this uh, giant sphere mitochondria. It's uh, almost six uh, microns in diameter. And this uh, sphere is called the uh, Nebenkern. Nebenkern uh, in German is next to the nucleus. And then uh, this uh, nebenkern is composed of these uh, two mitochondrial masses wrapped around each other. And uh, it has like this uh, concentric circles of membranes. So this stage also termed the onion stage because it resembles an onion in cross-section. And then these two masses uh, start to elongate along the sperm tail and uh, separate from each other. And by the end, we have this mature sperm two millimeters long with two millimeter long uh, mitochondria. So as you can see, these uh, images, they were 
uh, uh, these drawings were based on the actual uh, EM images and uh, this process was uh, described in ultrastructural details uh, even through 70s by Tokayasu and his team. So, uh, but uh, the main question of my uh, uh, interest was the mitochondrial fusion, this process, how it, this process happened. So in order to get better insight in this uh, process, I applied uh, several uh, uh, microscopy techniques, so I used EM, but EM is uh, really hard to perform and you get, you need to fall in exactly in the, uh, in the correct slice and you get only like a thin section that doesn't represent the whole tissue. Uh, so I turned to the expansion microscopy. Expansion microscopy is really a nice technique that allows you to use a, a regular uh, confocal or any other fluorescent microscope to visualize your samples. And it gives you much better resolution. So uh, how it works, actually the samples just physically expanded. Uh, in this uh, cartoon, you can see like a, represented, let's say this is the sample, so it's expanded uh, four times and you can see much more details. Uh, and there are several expansion techniques available now. You can find any different uh, kinds of techniques uh, online and every year we have new techniques uh, rising. So I'll give you a short overview of the uh, three techniques that I have exper uh, experience with. So let's start first with the uh, main principle of the expansion microscopy. So first you have your sample, you fix it, uh, you embed it into gel, you digest it using uh, either a chemical digestion and denaturation by heat or uh, enzymatic digestion. And then you add water and your gel swells and the sample expands. And then you can visualize the sample using a confocal or other fluorescent microscope. Uh, so the first protocol uh, dealing with expansion microscopy uh, was uh, this one. Sorry, it was this one, but then uh, this is like uh, the more modern one, the, the newest one. Uh, so in this uh, technique, actually, um, you send your sample before you start the expansion, uh, expansion protocol. Uh, so the sample is stained with uh, antibodies or uh, sorry, with antibodies or with uh, probes, DNA probes labeled with the uh, fluorophores. Uh, after that, it, uh, it is uh, anchored to the gel with uh, uh, some kind of acrylate uh, anchors. And then uh, after that, it undergoes digestion. In this uh, digestion process, some of the proteins are um, digested and uh, only the part that is linked to the gel remains. And then when you add water, the uh, sample swells uh, up to four times, and then you can image it really nicely. So, so, how, so I'll, I'll show you in a minute the, the images that uh, I've obtained using this technique, but I want first to give you some, uh, uh, some tips and some uh, notes that I uh, have to this technique. So first of all, you should use small amount of samples, uh, eight to, uh, to 10 samples, because you should remember this is a pretty uh, tedious process to work with, uh, to create, to go through. And uh, after that, you want to image and your samples are much larger than the samples that you started with. So uh, you should take it in account because it will be, it will take longer to image each sample so it's better to start with small amount of samples. Uh, second, uh, you should use the, the double amount of antibody, uh, of the uh, first antibody and second antibody, and the incubation with the second antibody should be done for longer period because, for, for example, when I stain my samples, I usually uh, use the uh, one up to two hour incubation with the secondary antibody, but here you should uh, do up to six hours incubation or, or sometimes I put it in the uh, four degrees over weekend and there are several uh, fluorophores that you should use and several that you shouldn't use. For example, uh, psi uh, fluorophores don't uh, work really uh, good with this uh, method and uh, with any expansion me method 
because they bleach really fast after the expansion. So um, I should use these ones from the from this list. And for some reason, I don't know why, but Alexa 647 uh, also doesn't work. So after uh, we use your sample, you do the anchoring. Uh, in this uh, protocol, I anchor using uh, MANHS, which is the uh, ester that is uh, bound to, uh, from one side it has a chrysate group, and from the other side it uh, has the ester group, and the, it uh, uh, binds to, um, it binds to, uh, to the, from one side from, to the proteins, from the other side to the gel. Uh, next step is the gelation step. So for the gelation, for the gelation step, I build these uh, uh, bridges using uh, uh, slides. So it's regular slides, two cover glasses that I glue using the super glue. In the middle, I put my sample embedded in gel and cover it with cover slip. So in this case, you, you just create this kind of a gelation chamber. Because different protocols have different um, techniques to do this, but I found that this one is the easiest one to do because some in some protocols I saw people making some kind of wells, and it's uh, more difficult to my opinion. So this was the easiest one, and it worked fine for me. And also, if you have if your sample is uh, thicker than one cover glass, you can uh, put two cover glasses, one on top of each other. So the, your cavity will be larger for your sample. And this also allows you to image your samples before the expansion. The imaging step is uh, really important because uh, then you can compare your sample before and after expansion and evaluate the expansion rate and also uh, the distortion rate of the sample, which is really nice. And after the gelation is done, you can store the sample, uh, the, this, uh, uh, this uh, slides in the humidity chamber using uh, PBS. So this actually this first uh, uh, part, the steps one, two, three, uh, can be done in like uh, the staining. Of course, takes time, but then the gelation step uh, and the imaging can be done in one day. Next day, after. Um, after you image the sample, you can start with digestion and expansion. Uh, so for this step also, it's really important to, uh, if your sample is visible in, the, in this thing, it's uh, really important to cut as, low, as close to the sample uh, because otherwise, if you don't cut it close to the sample, uh, after the expansion, you won't be able to find your sample in the gel because it becomes transparent. So cut with the razor blades, syringe needle, or forceps the gel as close to the sample as possible, but leave some edges around it. And using a flat uh, wet brush, you can transfer the sample easily from one place to another. So the next step of the digestion I do uh, in these uh, wells, but you can use any plastic plate or whatever is comfortable for you. And the digestion does, uh, is done with the usage of protein SK. And after the digestion, uh, there is the expansion stage that is done uh, uh, overnight. And the next day, you can already image your sample. For imaging the sample, I call this IPD wells. These wells have cover glass on the bottom. And this is, these are the wells, like eight wells, but they have different sizes. And it's really convenient because you can play, place all of your samples in the, the same slide. I cover the bottom part with polyalizing, so my sample uh, easily sticks to the bottom of these uh, wells. And uh, uh, for the next stage, I just put it in the in this uh, transfer the, the expanded samples with brush to this IBD wells, and I can image uh, easily. From an, with inverted microscope. Uh, so here you can see the example of the expanded tissue. So this is how the test looks like. Uh, in my case, I used two proteins labeled fluorescently, MARF GFP and Fazionion TT tomato. It doesn't matter 
uh, what are the proteins, but they are exp expressed in the mitochondria. So you can see the mitochondria. And you can see uh, the nice, uh, nice structure that is it can be it, that can be visualized after the expansion. So you can see in the first row the uh, meiotic dividing cell, second row uh, early stage of mitochondrial fusion, next later stage the onion stage, and then the elongating uh, uh, sperm this, that only starts to elongate. So actually, also it is possible to use. Uh, uh, DNA dyes in this stage, you can uh, use before, just before the expansion stage, or also even after the first expansion round, you can uh, use the host, for example, other DNA dye, and then you can also vi visualize your DNA. So this was a technique that uh, is applied to the samples that are already stained. But there are several other techniques in which you first expand the sample and then you stain. Uh, I actually, I wanted also to show you some samples that I just found uh, uh, online. So this technique was already applied to bacteria and yeast. I know that many people have different uh, tissues or different uh, samples that they, they would like to work, to work with. And I think that the protocols are published for most for most type of tissues, you just need to look online and you'll find everything. So it looks like it works really nicely for bacteria and for yeast. And this, the stages are literally the same. The first you link the, uh, the stain sam uh, sample to the gel, then you do gelation, then you do digestion. The digestion is uh, usually proteolytic digestion, and then you expand. So the same is for yeast. Uh, so this was staining before the expansion, but there is uh, there are several techniques that apply staining after the expansion. So most of them are based on the magnified analysis of the proteome uh, expansion technique. In this uh, technique, you first uh, fix the sample, you uh, bind it to the gel, exp uh, digest it using uh, usually SDS and heat and some other chemicals. And then you uh, expand it and then you stain after the expansion. So the technique that uh, I have experience uh, with is the ultrastructural expansion microscopy, which allows you to expand the sample up to eight times. This technique, you first fix the sample, anchor it, uh, Using, if you remember uh, in my previous slide, uh, previous slides there I used the uh, MANHS ester for anchoring. So in this case, you use formaldehyde and acrylamide, acrylamide uh, anchoring, gelate, uh, and then you denaturate the gel using uh, heat and uh, SDS. Expand it one round, stain it, and then there is a second round of expansion. So this allows you to expand the samples up to eight times. In my case, I wasn't able to expand it up to eight times. It was around five times maybe, but still it worked okay. But the problem is um, because of the chemical and uh, heat digestion, the denaturation of the gel, some of the, some of the antibodies won't work for this technique because uh, the epitopes they change their uh, three uh, their 3D structure and uh, some antibodies won't recognize the proteins. So for this technique, sorry, for this technique, it is easier to use. Uh, it, sorry, it is advised to use the uh, uh, antibodies that probably would work for Western blood because uh, in case of Western, we also denaturate the proteins before. Uh, so, uh, also, you, uh, this protocol was also published and it has a different uh, uh, anchoring and different uh, fixation method for different uh, uh, organelles or samples that uh, some, someone would like to visualize. For example, for mitochondria, the one that I wanted to visualize, I used PFA with glutaraldehyde. And if someone wants to visualize microtubules, 
it is done using methanol and uh, here you can see optimization for each one of the organelles or organ even small organism like uh, uh, to uh, like toxoplasma i think they did mm, yeah toxoplasma so here are the examples that uh, they show in their paper uh, here you can see the phage that was uh, uh, expanded uh, human psyllium and basal, basal bodies toxoplasma and mitochondria so it can also be applied to a variety of samples and this protocol is also pretty easy it takes about uh, two to three days to finish and it's uh, not very complicated well um to apply and next uh, so what's the uh, what's the advantages of uh, post expansion staining versus the pre expansion staining and the pre, uh, when you stain your sample before the expansion some of the epitopes are masked because just the of the physical sides of the uh, sizes of the antibodies that bind to these epitopes and for example this epitope uh, won't be able to bind to the uh, antibody and after expanded it's uh, accessible to the antibody to bind and also there is this uh, thing called the linkage arrow uh, so for example we have this microtubule that uh, is has uh, this is 25 uh, micro uh, so, sorry 25 nanometers in diameter and it's bound with the first antibody and second antibody. So the calculated side of which or each one of this uh, first and second antibody complex is uh, 20 nanometers. So together 64 nanometers. After expansion, 65, uh, 65 nanometers uh, four times, you get the size of 260 nanometers. And uh, this, uh, is, is this doesn't rep represent the correct proportions of the microtubule uh, in contrary when you have this uh, microtubule and uh, it is ex expanded first four times so it's 100 nanometers and then you bind it with antibodies the size is only 140 nanometers and uh, it's more accurate and you get better uh, resolution and better picture in this case Another technique is, ah, sorry, the, uh, this expansion method, the ultrastructural expansion is also discussed in this really nice uh, workshop uh, given by Andor. You can find it online and it's also appears in the group's document. Uh, Gabriella already put it there. So I really recommend you to listen to this uh, workshop because it's really informative and it has a really good explanation. And uh, Sorry, <coughs> it has a really nice explanation about the uh, different expansion techniques that it uh, compares between several techniques and also has a nice uh, uh, samples uh, uh, demo that you can see. Actually, I uh, for my imaging, I also use uh, under a microscope uh, the spinning disk dragonfly, which is a really nice confocal spinning disk because the samples are so large so the amount of data that you need to collect is enormous and uh, it's better to use a fast microscope <laughs> than the slow one so next technique uh, is the pan expansion microscopy technique which allows you to uh, enlarge the sample up to 16 times so first as in the previous uh, protocols uh, we fix the cells and embed it into gel and next the gel is denaturated de and during this step it's already expanded and then there is the first expansion which is done overnight and we get the four times four, four to four point five times expansion next uh, the sample is embedded again in one gel and another gel twice embedded in two gels so it's uh, three gels in total and then uh, there is a um, denaturation of both gels 
uh, the first and the second gels, and the sample uh, is uh, stained and expanded. So, in this case, uh, you can use PANS proteome staining, which is really nice that it allows you to visualize all of the uh, organelles or different parts of the cell without using any uh, antibodies. So if you're looking for different architecture of the cell and you could want to look at the different uh, parts inside of it, it's really a nice uh, option. So here, uh, how it's done, uh, uh, the dye is called an HS ester. It binds to the primary amine groups on the proteins. And on the other side, it has usually the fluorophore. And then uh, it just stains everything. So here in this image, you can see the staining before the expansion. So you don't see much, you just see most of, mostly the background. We actually applied it also to four time uh, X expansion, the regular one, after uh, the staining and everything is done and be just uh, before the expansion. And here you can see the image of the 16 X. So you can uh, appreciate how nicely, for example, here the mitochondria is visualized using this, uh, uh, this time. So let's see what, what sorry, <laughs> this one jumps. So here you can see the images that I obtained using this uh, technique, the ultrastructural expansion. So you can uh, really appreciate uh, how nicely I can see different parts of the cell and the arch architecture of them. You can see the nucleus with both of its membranes. This is the Nebenkern, the mitochondria that I look at. Um, and uh, it's really, really uh, nice, but the downside of this technique is, most, is that most of the antibodies don't work after this extended uh, uh, denaturation steps. In my hands, I was only able to stain with certain anti-GFP antibody to visualize uh, membranes in, of the mitochondria because I have one of my proteins is fluorescently tagged with GFP. But uh, I wasn't able to apply other antibodies, but in paper, in uh, the original paper, uh, that describes this, this technique. They have several other antibodies that they claim that uh, work fine for this technique. So I also consulted the authors of the paper and uh, uh, they gave me some really nice uh, suggestions of uh, what I can to improve, uh, what I can improve in my, um, in, in this method, in, using my samples and it, uh, it worked really nicely, but without staining. So, so here you can see the comparison of two expansion techniques that I used to the EM images. This is the Forex expansion. This is the Pan expansion. So it was uh, uh, claimed to be up to 16 times uh, in my hands. Sometimes it works better, sometimes it works worse. So some, in this case, it was uh, 12 times, but uh, in some cases, it was up to 15 times X expansion. So I guess it depends on the materials that you use. Uh, you should use really fresh materials and don't wait too long uh, um, in different stages because this is also the reason why we shouldn't use too many samples. If you're too ambitious, you use too many samples. So sometimes you mess it up and uh, you get with the less desired result. So here you can see the comparison between the EM image and the expanded images. Uh, and you can appreciate that the architecture is uh, pretty similar and there is no much distortion of the sample. So it's really nice to see that uh, we get similar similar result with the expansion technique. So just to uh, summarize, um, so uh, I told you about uh, pre-expansion staining versus the post-expansion staining techniques. So the samples are 
pretty much everything that you can think of. Uh, sometimes uh, it's, it, it can be applied even to uh, some proteins in the, the sorry, some proteins uh, uh, or protein complexes in, in the solution and cell culture, whole tissue, everything that you can think of. As, so, for example, the this technique, the pan expansion, the microscopy technique, it's original, what was originally applied to tissue culture, but after that they developed a protocol which allows to visual visualize brain slices. And the antibodies, uh, the pre-expansion staining, you use the same antibodies as for regular immunohistochemistry. As for post-expansion staining, uh, not many antibodies work, so you should use uh, uh, the the ones that work for Western blood and hope that <laughs> they will work. In my hands, uh, when I use the ultrastructural expansion, um, I use the anti this anti this red antibody which worked really fine. Uh, the digestion in pre-expansion staining is enzymatic, and post-expansion staining is chemical digestion and heat denaturation. Uh, expansion final expansion factor for pre-expansion is four times, for past expansion up to 16 times. The time, uh, the, the pre-expansion staining is uh, less time consuming, it's only two to three days, while post-expansion staining takes longer, especially the ultrastructural expansion, sorry, especially, especially the pan-expansion staining, pan-expansion protocol, which is, uh, takes longer. And the final imaging uh, uh, for well, as much as you expand the sample, it becomes uh, thicker and uh, larger, so it's more difficult to, to visualize it. So in Forex, uh, it wasn't a problem, but when I did the 6 x I have to slice the sample in the middle to make thinner sections to visualize it. So it's uh, also something to take into account, and also the sample becomes really, really large, so it will take longer to visualize it. So uh, that's it. This is my group. Uh, this is our lab. This is my boss, Eli Arama. And I uh, will be uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Lina. That was great. Um, I'll let people unmute themselves if they want to ask a question, or you're happy to write them in the chat otherwise. Um, what people are thinking about that. I have a few questions for you. Um, one of them was like, do you need to have any sort of like fiducials or beads in the sample to make to know exactly how much it expands? Or is just by known structures that you were calculating? Yeah, uh, I, I calculated uh, because I know that my mitochondria, this large mitochondria, is uh, 6.7 uh, microns in diameter. I can calculate it after that, compare the size. I also visualize it before and after expansion because my samples are fluorescently labeled even before expansion. So I can go to the microscope, visualize it, and just find the same uh, region in my sample and visualize it and see. So it's really easy, but uh, also, some people just measure the size of the gel before and after, but when you use pan expansion technique, you slice the gel several times because you have several gelation steps, so you slice to the excess gel, so it's more difficult. So beads, I don't think the beads would work because, uh, uh, well, they probably won't expand as well as the sample. I don't know what are they made, but I guess they won't expand the same extent. So usually it's um, better to have something in the cell that you know the size of it, for example, the nucleus or the centriole or whatever, and then you can measure it before and after. Um, there's quite a few congratulations in the chat. Um, and also a question, um, from Matthew wrote about, I was wondering if the expansion is uniform across all cell structures or do you find that certain structure expand differently? 
Okay, so um, the lipid droplets don't expand uh, and they don't survive really good the protocol because of the denaturation steps and um, all the and others. In my case, for example, uh, I have this uh, two millimeter long sperm, right? And it has the axonym, which is the microtubule actually. And uh, a part of it breaks in like small chunks because it's very rigid. So when it's expanding, in some cases, it uh, doesn't go well through digestion and it breaks in parts. But yeah, some things, that's why they also use different, uh, different uh, fixing uh, techniques for like different fixing reagents for different structures that uh, of interest. But usually it's pretty uniform, but some structures, the rigid ones, the ones that are really dense, that are really dense, sometimes they can break down into parts. The other question would be like, if you're like a newbie and you just want to try one of these techniques, which one you would go for? Okay. Uh, the, yeah, I forgot to mention this. You should definitely start with the simplest expansion technique when you stand your sample before the first one that I uh, discussed, because uh, it's pretty straightforward and also you can visualize your sample before and after to evaluate uh, the expansion rate and to see if it's not distorted and to compare it. So it's really, uh, I would start with this one. I would start with the first one. And also really when people uh, ask me to teach them expansion, some uh, from other labs, I advise them to, to start with the first, uh, the first uh, pre-staining pre sample expansion. Okay, great. <laughs> There's no more questions in the chat. Uh, the only other question was if you would be willing to share the slides with some of the attendees. Um, that's another question we read after. Um, but I might ask you that by email later. Um, I wonder what the minimum size of the sample um, you can use for this technique. Um, oh, what's uh, with us? Uh, sorry, that was a little too great. Uh, what's the minimum si um, size of the sample? Yeah, I think it it was applied to protein complexes, so I guess uh, several nanometers is okay. Also, single mm -hmm. cells are fine because it is really developed for any kind of sample. Yeah. I guess the, the question becomes then a little bit the handling of the sample. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ah, okay. So that's why you have the gel. So you can yeah. cut to the size that you are interested in. Uh, let's say test this samples. I, I would, well, you can't cut it smaller than something that you can uh, <laughs> see with your eyes, right? So. Um, yeah, as, as small as possible, but you won't cut it smaller than something that you can lift up with the brush. Um, there's another question. Um, do you experience photo bleaching, photo bleaching problems during imaging in water, and how long can you store the samples in water? Okay, the samples can be stored up to one week in water. And also you can expand them gradually, you can store some of them in PBS and apply the, to the ones that you want to image. Now you can expand them and start with them. Uh, in my hands, it was uh, good for up, for up to one week. Uh, and uh, yeah, it depends on the fluorophores. As I said before, the Psi-5, for example, or all the other Psi fluorophores bleach fast and uh, I don't know why, but for some reason I ordered an uh, 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 the one that for proteome staining. I bought one that is uh, conjugated to Psi-5 
So it bleaches fast, much faster than other fluorophores. So yeah, you have, so of course you have photo bleaching and to start with the signal is uh, much weaker than the, you would have in the regular samples before the expansion because uh, the distance between the fluorophores is larger. So you, you would have to use uh, stronger lasers and, strong, and longer ex uh, exposure times. So yeah, it will bleach eventually. But I don't think it's, uh, it will bleach more than the regular uh, fluorescent stain, stain sample. But there's no anti-fading or anything like it in the solution, mm -hmm. in the solution. Sorry? Anti-fade reagent, no? On the solution, no. It's just PBS. No, it's just PBS. Mm. No. You start in PBS and then in water. After it's expanded, you have to store it in the water because you don't want it to shrink back. Uh, this is another question about, can you expand paraffin embedded histology sections? No, because it's in paraffin already. So if you deparaffinize. Uh, so so what's it, what, what is usually done, you, instead of embedding it in paraffin, you embed it in gel, and then you can slice it using a vibroton. Yeah. And then you get, thin sections. For example, for the brain tissue, they did it uh, this way. They first fixed it, then they sliced it, and then they fixed it again and embedded it into gel. And after expansion, it can be sliced again. So instead of paraffin, you just use the gel. The, that's it. I don't see any further questions in the chat. Um, but um, yeah, we wanted to thank you. There's a lot of congratulations in the chat about the great talk. And it's great to get some practical tips <laughs> because yeah. Yeah, it's easier to read the papers and be like, oh, but the, so from someone that has done it, that's great help. Um, yeah, yeah, just really just. Jump into the water and try it. It's really not. Uh, it's not very complicated. You just you just need to try to see how it works. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for joining. All right. Um, so yeah, I am looking at the chat now, and I also. Do forget that this is a recording. <laughs> Good thing for Zoom on one part that we can, and like the recordings that we can do this, but at the same time, like it's so easy to, to forget that, you know, they're not actually there. So um, in the future, I will keep that in mind and try to see if, um, depending on where the speaker is um, in the world, maybe I can ask them to come to our meeting as well, even if we're watching the recording, uh, maybe just even for the short uh, Q&A period so that um, you know, anyone with questions can direct them um, back at them. Um, but there's always email and the discussion board. So I'll make sure to send an email to um, the speaker and let them know that, you know, we have a few questions and she's willing to either do a Q&A session with us next time or um, just respond by email or on the discussion board directly. Um, and I think uh, looking at the chat, we had a question from Alex about, um, yeah, I also thought that too, when she mentioned that the sci-fi um, is not good with expansion, but then it actually somehow does work with the other techniques. And I think, um, Brenda, you had a response to that. Um, do you want to unmute or would you prefer I read out? That's okay, I can unmute. Um, actually, I thought that trick is that the, um, um, Second thing that she mentioned was a post expansion staining and therefore it gets around using the side eyes because it's also post digestion and that's the trick to it. Uh, all the side eyes and the Alexa floor 647 are vulnerable to protease K digestion, but if you're staining after the digestion, it does not matter. And that's the trick. Great. Thank you, Brenda, for that. That's um, yeah. I'm actually also trying out a post 
um, expansion stating because I think last time I asked about um, a dialect 647 for vasculature staining. And uh, for anyone who knows, like this doesn't, uh, this dye specifically doesn't get retained um, after expansion. So I'll probably have to do another round um, just to get by that. But yeah, if anyone here has any experience with that, please shoot me a message, let me know. Um, I'm kind of struggling with that bit for now. Um, does anybody else have any other questions that they want to put towards um, our group today for this discussion? I thought it might be worth just pointing out that in the master document that's linked at the top, there's links to where you can actually um, submit dyes, I think, aren't there? There's a, you're, you're collecting dyes and yeah. proteins and so on. So if people have experience with any of these where they have or have not worked, I think you can put those into that, uh, that uh, form and then Natalie's gonna be pulling those resources together to share with this group eventually, I think. Yes, exactly. So I was also going to say, um, and for our last uh, two presenters that we've had, they presented a lot of good papers and like publications, very recent ones. Um, so I'm probably going to go back there and pull the publications that they've um, referred to and kind of populate that into our either protocols or publication database so that um, everyone in this group can kind of refer back. You know, if you're doing whole tissue imaging, you can go back to find this uh, presentation so you don't have to watch the video again just to look for the papers and then the other one was more um, for uh, verifying or validation techniques so I'll also um, group that together and yeah so we can kind of have that as a database for all of us. So we have a question in the chat by Sujan asking is there someone working with mouse lung slices for expansion if yes what digestion method have you been using for it? I have not, this is Brenda Jarvis again, I've not used it for digesting lung slices for EM, but years ago I did it for digesting um, for fax analysis and we use collagenase for that. Like we, in digest, we digested the lungs completely away. And if I remember right, we did, um, It's been so long. I'm sorry, I have to look it up. Uh, so Jen, if you want me to, I'll look that up and send that. I can send that to you. Drop me your email and I'll send you the protocol and you could try adapting it. Got it. I have a question. Hi, uh, I'm Valeria from Mexico. Um, my question is very basic and generic for everybody. Based on your experience, uh, if your goal is to uh, expand tissues, whatever kind, does it make any sense to begin with uh, trying to expand cell cultures? So the change in the sample type, is it uh, something that you can learn something from or changing sample every time makes a big change also in the conditions for the exam for the expansion microscopy so we need to expand tissue but we started from cell culture and we are experiencing some problems so we, we are I'm, we are not sure if we have to keep working on that or directly make our effort towards tissues Um, so I guess I can start. Um, so I just started my master's. So this is my first year in my master's and I jumped straight into um, going into mice brain slices instead of doing cell culturing. I think the protocols now are very, um, they're very up to date and uh, there are constantly new ones coming out, especially for brain tissue. Um, and I think they're, they're pretty reliable in the sense that I jumped straight into it and by the second or third time I was able to expand um, my sample, I think, uh, pretty well. Um, I'm still working on the validation techniques and making sure that, like was mentioned in the video, 
Um, it's kind of hard to tell on what days or like with what reagents you'll get like a uniform like four or five time expansion versus like sometimes you just it looks a little smaller than the other day that you had. Um, but aside from that, I think like the protocols out there. So um, the one there was one mentioned uh, the one mentioned in the talk uh, for the tissue slice was also uh, very good. And um, in a previous paper, there's also a very famous one that everyone pretty much follows uh, that specifically tells you for 200 micron thick brain slices, this is kind of the standard protocol and I've tested it out a few times and it works. Um, they also have a uh, section specifically for um, brain tissues or tissue slices that are thicker than 200 microns that I have not done yet. But um, yeah, looking at the papers, I think you're pretty good to just start with um, my, like or like just tissue instead of going to cell culturing. Uh, but because I personally haven't done cell culturing, maybe somebody who have done both can give you a better sense of that. You can also post it on the discussion board um, and see what people suggest. I think that's a very, I really like that question. It's very open-ended. So a lot of people can provide their input for that. And where is that discussion board, Natalie? Do you have a... It's, yep, it's linked to um, our master document now, um, right beneath the ongoing user group notes. There's a link saying expansion microscopy user group discussion board. And then the first page is instructions on how um, we're kind of labeling the questions versus um, the responses. And the only issue or downside, I guess, not really an issue is that if you post a question, we do ask that you go back and check on any updates because there's no notification or anything that you'll get if anybody responds to your thread. So yeah, if anybody has any questions for the speaker, um, you're welcome to send them straight to me and I can kind of forward them all to her or just post them on the discussion board and see if she can respond um, at her own time. If not, we did have the meeting set to end at 10 o'clock today. Um, so yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, happy New Year, Happy Lunar New Year. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to shoot me a message. Before everybody goes, I would like to do a very quick plug for some of the upcoming events for uh, Bino. We have a number of speaker events coming up and I'm just gonna drop in the chat um, a link to our activities page where you can find information about all of these. So we've got a scientific speaker series. We've also got a um, career speaker series and then there's also a Lattice Light Sheet um, user group that's being put together. So if you're interested in any of those, you can find information on that page um, on the Bina site and come join us. It'd be great. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all.